awesome to be able to, to sing a song together of this Christ child who we celebrated and who came as a, as a baby, so seemingly insignificant to the world, and yet these millennia later, people still gathering and saying, now we see you clearly and you are worthy of it all. It's a joy to be amongst those people. Um, I always look at the week in between Christmas and New Year's as a bit of a no man's land. I don't know if you guys feel the same kind of way. What day is it? Nobody even knows. Are we working? Are we not working? Where are we going? You know, um, I know for many of you, you're still like in the midst of, you know, holiday celebrations. Um, you've had some of Christmas, but now you're ready to, to pack up and you're going to do some road trips or someone's on their, on their way in. Um, those are some of our, our plans for the week. We're grateful to get to see family in the middle of the week, you know, so we know, we know that feeling. I know that for some in this room, or maybe even to all of us to a certain extent, there's a point of feeling like, whew, like, we made it. I'm still alive on uh, December 26th, and, and uh, maybe even a little bit of a feeling of like, okay, we're done. We, we got everything put together, and it's a miracle. We never thought we'd get uh, through the list, and now we actually kind of enter into this time of, of like recovery mode, you know? Recovery, maybe some feelings of like it's time to, to wrap up. Um, it's time to put things away. The lights are going to come down at some point. Time for the tree to come down and be sunk in a lake somewhere as a fish habitat and stuff like that. I got to tell you guys, that was so new to us when we moved to Missouri a couple years ago. We bought our first Christmas tree, I remember, and I remember just asking a guy in the store, he said, so now is it common, like when you're done with this thing, that we just put it on the street, you know, because that's what we did, like in Illinois, and, and the guy, I think it was at Nixa Hardware, was like, you know what, you can just throw it out in the pond in your backyard, and it becomes a fish habitat, and I think we looked at each other like, is he for real? I think he's talking to us about like real things, but we didn't know. And sure enough, my neighbor last year, we're like getting ready to go and he's got a place down on Table Rock and they're like, we'll take your tree, we'll bring it in, we'll tie a rock to it and sink this thing. And so you learn new stuff all the time. This is great. So anybody needs a place for your Christmas tree to go, my neighbor will take it. But all this to say, we're in this period of time where it, it's like, okay, are we, are we done? Are we ready to move on? And in the midst of that feeling, and while some of that's so natural, I want us to not race too quickly past everything that we've just studied together and all the truths that we have celebrated because there is so much there that is never to be packed away. That's never to be packed away. We've celebrated this theme of, of a new and a glorious morning. Everything that Christmas is, is all about Everything that the Gospel of Matthew has powerfully laid out to us about the identity and the purpose of Jesus in, in history, the great light has come. And as we get to December 26, I think we want to be here together to say, we're not going to move on from that. Those are not things that we simply pack in a, in a bin and get it back to that back corner of the, the basement or the, the attic. In fact, far from. We want to go the opposite direction and say this is time for us to now fully embrace the light that we know has come. To bring this joy and this excitement forward into this coming year as we look towards new things. And so, as I mentioned over the last weeks, we've considered this theme of a new and glorious morning. And each week in the worship folder at the bottom, there's three application questions we've built off of these. Oftentimes in the message, we came to those at the end. This morning, I want to just kind of read them again by way of application, because this is where we can be thinking. You know, in the light of the reality of Jesus and who he is and everything that he's done, how will we be people who watch for this light? Like we're, we're on the, the, the hills and we're looking and just saying, Jesus, reveal to us more and more your light, who you are, what your plan is in this world. How can we shine the light? Even as Cameron just prayed, Lord, we want to bring the light to the nations. And then, you know, specifically, we're thinking of people we're praying for. God, not just generally let us shine the light, but help us to shine the light to these Individual. So I'm thinking of these questions, and admittedly, there's all kinds of ways that we can bring application to what we've just studied and ways that we can respond to those questions. But there's one area 
And one piece of application I believe is so critical, so foundation for us to give our attention to this morning. And the response that I'm talking about is actually found, again, in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 4, and verses 16 and 17. I'm going to read first verse 16, and this was where our whole theme for our Advent series came from. The people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region of the shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. Now verse 17. This this dawn is declared. The light has come. It's a new and glorious morning. Now what do we read? From that time Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So the light has come, it's to be embraced, it's to be grasped, it's to be lived out, incorporated into our lives, but the critical and the foundational response in that journey is the action of repentance. The action of repentance. And so I want to unpack this idea together this morning, but will you first pray with me once again? Lord, I'm so grateful that we can be here this morning and Come with expectant and and joyful hearts. Lord, the world around us is is, uh, lethargic, but but we're here, (laughs) and we're excited to hear from you, and your spirit is alive and working, and so, Lord, be on the move. Be on the move, because you have given us so much to celebrate, so much truth. Now show us how to, to see that lived out. We're grateful in your name. Amen. Well, embracing the, the light is, is a part of, of a comprehensive repositioning of ourselves in life. It's complete re-entor, re- reorientation of, of every part of who we are. It's a turning from one reality to another. So the dawn, as we talked about, this light of Jesus and Emmanuel, it broke into the darkness and as much as this brings us hope it also reminds us of the state of the world prior to the dawn prior to the light coming long lay the world in sin and error pining right this is where the world was at before the gospel became clear and jesus entered time history It's very easy for us to declare that this is the reality of of the world before Jesus came and to kind of do this in a sense where the darkness is out there, it's to blame other forces and and to some regards this this is true but it's really important for us to be aware that the darkness in which we dwell prior to the arrival of the light is not simply something that's out there not something that we simply point fingers at, not simply something that we are victims of. The darkness that is in this world is something that we have participated in. It is also something that is in us. In fact, if we're listening to the scriptures, it's something that we have loved. So the truth is clear. If we're going to experience the hope and the promise of the arrival of the dawn, really see that take root and make change in our lives we're going to have to sever our allegiance with the darkness turn our backs to it turn our our faces from one direction to another at its core concept this this can't be any more simple i mean we we get this you you just cannot as a person be facing two directions at once maybe this is even part of why god created us as kind of one directional beings that we would understand these kind of things you you can't be someone who travels east and west at the same time as i mentioned some of us are still in the middle of of christmas celebrations and travels and so maybe we're going to go see someone today or tomorrow or maybe we're someone who's been visiting and we're going to head on our way home and at some point here maybe we're headed back to st louis or maybe we're headed towards joplin or back to texas or oklahoma there's going to be a moment of decision right because i i can't get to oklahoma city headed towards st louis and and vice versa friends this is simple enough for us to understand and so as we come to this idea of the light and turning towards the light 
we have to at the very same time turn away from the darkness. And here we have the fundamental of the biblical concept of repentance. Simple enough, it means to turn. In the Old Testament, there's a Hebrew word for it. It was shuv. And it meant to turn, and it meant to to pivot. It was a turn from one path, the darkness, toward the path of light and walking back towards the ways of the Lord. And this turn was, was way more than just words. Far more than just words. It was a change of heart that then led to a change in thoughts, change in our actions and we see this all over the the old testament and book after book as the prophets call the old testament straying people of israel to repent to to turn from one direction to another similar themes are going to come forth in the new testament look how poignant the words of john are in chapter three i mean you talk about one biblical message right same themes coming through john 3 19 through 21 and this is the judgment the light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil for everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works be exposed they're heading one way they love the darkness you're going to face that way and they don't want to turn around because they don't want the light to expose them on the other hand, verse 21, but whoever does what is true comes to light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Directional, one way or the other. So in sum, no surprise at all that as we read about the light coming to those who are dwelling in the shadow of death, the light is done that right after that, in this summary of what Jesus' teaching and preaching was all about, that he would say, turn. Turn turn from everything that was dark to me and my kingdom i am the light of the world jesus is preaching that we have summed up here for us in matthew chapter 4 is actually a summary of everything that we read in the chapter preceding it. i'm talking about matthew chapter 3 matthew chapter 3 tells us the story of another christmas baby that we often remember kind of at the early part of Advent and then we just kind of forget about him from then until now. We're talking about John. Do you remember, remember John? Like the whole Advent story starts with Elizabeth and Zachariah and the miracle child. And what was spoken of about this little baby John? What was he going to do? Zachariah, his father himself, prophesied Luke chapter 1, verse 76. Again, I love these biblical themes. They're so woven in. They're all tied together. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. So John's destiny and the prophecy of what he was going to be about was being to call people to undergo a complete reorientation from the light to the darkness. As I mentioned, Matthew chapter 3 now, baby John is all grown up. And what does his prophesied ministry look like in real time? Well, true to prophecy, he comes calling people to prepare. Matthew chapter 3, 1 and 2 says, In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. What should his message be? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Summary of that, prepare the way for the Lord so that as the light comes, your life is ready to embrace it fully because you cannot have the darkness and the light dwelling together. John's call was not for mobilization against Rome. It wasn't for petitions and declarations against the darkness that was out there that everybody else was responsible for. John's call was for heart preparations of God's people beginning with this personal and deep look within. It involved personal turning from one's own connection with darkness. 
involved looking not just, not just to thoughts, theology, but to the way that that was going to impact actions and, and the decisions that flowed from this. The people listening to John were, were baptized then as a symbol of this turn and this re- repentance that we're talking about. And once again, the end result of embracing and living in the light of, of Jesus was to be this all-encompassing turn, repositioning that people were ready for the light of Jesus and his kingdom. All beginning with repentance. This was the message of John as to how the people would be ready. This was the message for how they could prepare the way of the Lord. Friends, the truth is this is that this wasn't just a message for the people there and then, the way things worked back then. The message is true for you and me today. For those of us who hear the Lord calling us to live for his light in the world now, repentance is the beginning of that journey. On one hand, as we mentioned, December 26 has the feeling of like, we made it. There's also a sense, I think, of like, now what? Now what? Maybe, you know, even some blues, and, and that's, that's okay. Those things are real and understandable, but I'm excited for us to be here together this morning with a sense, as we talked about, of expectancy, that in many ways this could be a definitive and even an exciting Sunday. Because even now, a lot of us are beginning to say, okay, what of January? What of next year? new resolutions even in our own walks with the lord and so i think here are the scriptures before us to be so helpful so full of vision so hopeful and rather than saying hey the party's over instead we can we can say no actually in truth the real stuff the real party of responding to everything that we've been talking about during this advent season is like right here it's right before us and in Matthew chapter 3 and 4 we see that the scriptures are clear about how to begin and the first step to take to embrace the dawn as we said it's repentance so that we may prepare the way for the Lord now as we come before the Lord with an attitude of, of repentance there's some really key concepts that we need to keep in mind there's three of them one at a time the first is preparation now this might seem just a little bit redundant because we're saying that repentance is the preparation but there's a bit of preparation for the preparation so let's unpack this just a little bit there's an interesting interchange that john the baptist has with the religious leaders who come out to kind of listen to what he's preaching if you ever want to kind of get your blood up read a little bit of john's sermons to the pharisees because this is what we read in verse 7 but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism he said to them you brood of vipers that's not really a seeker sensitive kind of a sermon just by way of reference who warned you to flee from the wrath to come bear fruit in keeping with repentance and do not presume to say to yourselves we have Abraham as our father for I tell you God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees every tree therefore that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire we don't know exactly why these religious leaders came out to to listen to John it might have been that they were kind of keeping a watch on what this upstart was was saying and kind of what was behind his movement maybe they just came they because they wanted to you know see what was going on in this tent meeting but it's clear that if it had anything to do with just making a show or if it had anything to do with just well this is in vogue and we kind of want to keep up appearances this is what's in right now by way of a religious expression John was going to have nothing to do with that. So he really takes out the scalpel and he shows them that they are clueless. They are unprepared for what this idea and practice of repentance is all about. 
If repentance is a way of preparation so that we may fully embrace Jesus and the light of his gospel, his identity, his, his work, his kingdom, preparing to repent is to understand what that step is all about. It's to understand what it means. It's to understand what the cost is. It's to understand what we are committing to. And indeed, the, the very first step is to say, Lord, I'm, I'm opening my heart to you so as to hear from you what the parameters are here. Indeed, I'm, I'm coming to you in repentance, but I, I need to listen to what work you say needs to happen here. I can come with my list of this and this and this, and honestly, my list is going to usually be pretty easy. Things that are not that big of a sacrifice for Zach to change. Things that were maybe already in process or things that aren't going to cost all that much. But friends, if I really desire to turn away from the darkness, I'm going to need to open up my heart first and just say, Lord, you're the only one that knows the deep business that needs to happen here. And though it be painful, I need to listen to you. And of course, this work takes some of the, the basic disciplines of, of just listening to him, of the scriptures being open before us, of prayer, of being in relationship with other people. We mentioned how vital it is to be in places of community. That's why being a part of a Sunday class or a, or a Bible study, a small group is so vital because, again, I can come up with the list of things that Zach needs to, to mature in, but I'll tell you what, when I get in a room with other people who know me really well, they're going to come up with a different list. I don't always like their list, which is why some of us avoid community, right? But it's so much better as the Lord works in those ways and changes us. So we say... Lord, prepare me to repent, speak, so I can know the darkness that you're calling me from in order to turn to the light because, Lord, those things may not be as obvious as I think that they are. So preparation. Let's talk a little bit about the power in the midst of this. Central to this entire chapter, Matthew 3, is John's statement that his ministry, while so important, is not the, the main deal. It is not the main course. Verses 11 through 12 say, and again, this is John, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Jesus brings power brings his holy spirit to bear friends repentance is an admission that we've not lived according to god's standards as well as this commitment to seek to bring our lives back into alignment with his holiness and yet even as we say this we can quickly see that repentance is a it's a quick reminder that we are never going to get things right we just can't Repentance, even in the most humble of hearts, at times feels like Groundhog's Day. Lord, I, I repent. I, I, I will not do this again. I'm turning back to you, only to find ourselves a week later, maybe a couple hours later, just needing to repent for the same thoughts, attitudes, actions. Even our best repentance often proves so weak so shallow and this is why Jesus' ministry is so much greater so John can call for repentance and preparation but his ministry cannot bring the power for real life change another who would come after him would deliver that in relationship with Jesus we find something so new and fresh don't we he brings a cleansing that lasts he brings purifying power. He brings the power of his Holy Spirit, God himself living in us and bringing our character into the likeness of him. 
Repentance does include the heart to make the right moral decisions. That's always a, a part of it biblically. But more than anything, even that births in us an understanding of what we cannot do. Right here, we're back to concepts like the Old Testament law and the purpose of it. The law could never bring us life in true change. And in so much the same way, repentance itself cannot bring or produce change. But it does bring us back to a place of holy desperation in expectancy for God's power, his grace that fills us with hope because of the promises of Jesus. So if I come to repent and I realize that, wow, I just stumble over and over again, it's just leading me back to remember, you know what? My own deeds are never going to cut it. As I come to repent, in those very same words, I'm saying, Lord, one of the things I repent for more than anything is thinking I can do it on my own. I repent of thinking I can change myself. Jesus, how I need you. And as we pray for that, I mean, immediately, we're on top of celebrating Christmas, aren't we? Because why did Jesus come? To bear the name of Yeshua, that he would save us from our sins. And what was the other name that we remember him by? Emmanuel, God with us God with us and even as we recognize these names and celebrate the gospel in those moments that's where then those application questions start to become natural deeply flowing out of us like a well how can I watch for Jesus more I'm desperate for him how can I share that light with other people oh I want to pray for other people to know him but we talk about Emmanuel. In this very chapter, John baptizes Jesus. Jesus, who has no, nothing to repent of himself, comes and identifies with us in what that is all about and says, I'm entering into the solution for human sin, not standing at a distance. Eventually, I will take on all human sin. What a joy. What a joy that we see that Emmanuel is with us in this, bringing the power that will bring lasting purification and lasting change. I've referenced before that C.S. Lewis's The Chronicles of Narnia are just such a joy and a treasure to us as, as a family. As I thought on these themes this week, there was a story that comes out of one of the later books, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. In the Voyage of the Dawn Treader, the, the children that C.S. Lewis often writes about are on a boat and they're part of this crew that is sailing to the edge of the world and they stop at various islands along the way and there's a whole adventure there. And then also C.S. Lewis ties in different object lessons and there's a lot of powerful, powerful images. But one that stuck with me all through my life and which actually came back to my remembrance this week was of a particular kid named Eustace. And Eustace is a cousin of, of uh, some of the other characters that we're more used to. And Eustace is a real pig. I mean, he really is. He is selfish, and he is self-centered, and he is just a, a grouch, and just everything revolves around him. At one point in the story, at a stop at an island, he's exploring out on his own. I think he's actually moping around, wondering why the universe isn't revolving around him the way that it should he comes upon this treasure. In fact, it's a hidden dragon's treasure. And he decides that, yeah, I'm going to help myself to the gold in here. And he picks up this bracelet. And he slips this bracelet on only to discover after falling asleep that this is a magic bracelet that he has stolen. And in fact, this magic bracelet has turned him into a dragon. And as if that wasn't bad enough, he discovers that this bracelet, which slipped onto his wrist as a boy, now as a strong and a huge dragon, has begun to constrict and become incredibly painful as his figure is too big for this. And so he is now in agony. He's this horrible creature that he cannot change. It's a binding shackle to him, this, this gold bracelet he is in agony. 
Well, this is where the power of the writing and the imagery of C.S. Lewis comes to bear. As Eustace realizes that he cannot rescue himself, that he has no hope and he is just daily in more and more pain for this bracelet that is on him, there's a night where in a dream, or he thinks it's a dream, the great lion Aslan comes and addresses him in this state. He comes and he speaks to Eustace and he says, it's time to shed your dragon scales. And Eustace says, you know what? You're right. And so he starts to dig away at at this and shed the skin and he realizes, you know what? Oh, this is a good process. Indeed, I, I can, I can lift off some of these scales but no he's mistaken for everything that he can seek to shed off just grows right back he is powerless to bring deep and lasting change Aslan then at that point realizes Eustace is where he needs to be in his heart to realize what he cannot do but what Aslan can do And so this great lion invites Eustace into a a, a well, into the pool. And as C.S. Lewis describes it, digs his claws to the deepest, deepest part of Eustace. Eustace feels like he's just to the core of his inner being. And it's only Aslan that can shed the dragon. It's only that power that can bring the deepest change and he ends up rescuing this boy Eustace making him alive and whole again Eustace had no power in and of himself he could repent and repent and repent and repent it wasn't until he repented and let the lion do the work that that true power that lasting change came and what an amazing picture of what this repentance is and what it's like to turn from the dark to the light wherein the light is the power and the change I want to mention one more aspect to this and this is process process so we had preparation power process there is a definitive moment wherein we say the cross before me the world behind me but repentance is also something that is lifelong involving our whole heart and our whole life the longer we walk with Christ the more our eyes are open the more that we see things maturely that Jesus is calling us to turn from The more that we walk with Jesus, the more we will hear him say, as we do in Revelation chapter 3, 19, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Sometimes we see this as a negative. Sometimes we look at the word repentance and we just think of all the, oh, it's such a jarring, it's such a a difficult word word and and of course yes i mean turning is it's never an easy thing but on another level if we're really listening to revelation 319 repentance comes because someone loves us and cares about us wants to pull us from all that is awful and dark in and outside of us some of the deep change takes time and indeed is a process. Not the decision to, to, to change, but that actual rooting out, that change of the dark, because it's sometimes so much a part of who we are. There are aspects to our personhood that take a lifetime of, of the Lord getting things back into alignment with who he is. Imagine us saying in our day-to-day, you know what, I repented of impatience, and done, done done it was awesome so glad that that was yesterday and today's you know or how about worry any of us struggle with that as an ongoing learning to trust in him we do repent of worry but it's not the one and done we continue to let him change us in fact as i was reviewing the story of eustace for uh for this this uh, message i was encouraged because 
the way that that particular chapter ends says that you know Eustace had been this horrible person said wish that we could say that from that moment on he didn't have any struggles no Lewis says it, it was a process but the cure had begun the cure had begun and friends this is again that repentance I was so encouraged to hear a pastor one time talk about a particular journey that he was on and giving more attentiveness to discipling his family and caring for them and it was just really something the Lord had called him to repent in but it struck me forever and it was so helpful he said when the Lord revealed that to me I began repenting I began repenting so as to say this became an ongoing turn in my life from where I once was to where the Lord was calling me to be. It was the, the great reformer Martin Luther that actually said, our Lord and Master Jesus Christ, when he said repent, willed that the whole life of believers should be repentance. This continued journey of saying, Lord, no more the darkness. Let us live and celebrate in your light. Friends, once again, simple reminder this morning that we're nowhere near ready to pack all this Christmas thing up. Put the lights away, the garland, probably good to take down the really, really dry tree. There's always a place for that. But it's time to celebrate the light. It's time to embrace the dawn fully. And we do this as we say, Lord, I repent. Show me how to repent. And even more so, Lord, bring your power to bear in the midst of this journey because I cannot do it without you. Friends, we live in the glory of a new and glorious morn. Jesus himself, Savior.